Well, we know that he is going to uh, get another shot with WWE. Uh, he reaches the, the pinnacle, you know, he's no longer just in the intercontinental or the tag team conversation. He becomes the WWE and world champion several times between 08 and 09. And he leaves when his contract expires in September of 09. But wouldn't you know it, just like he went back to WWE, he comes back to TNA. It's the first live Monday impact, January 4th, 2010. Uh, we've talked about this before in the archives available now. But one thing we didn't touch on a lot was what was your relationship like with Jeff at this point? When he's back in the company, we'll call it 13 years ago in 2010. I mean, you mentioned at the top of the show that you guys have done family vacations together. Are y'all tight here in 2010 or not quite yet? Um, it was always, I don't say off and on, but sometimes closer than others. Not, not closer. Sometimes more in contact with one another. You know, we could go a couple of months and not a phone conversation. Doesn't really mean we weren't on the same level of friendship if that makes sense. So no, yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he went off and was doing his thing at the WWE and I was doing my thing at, at TNA. He, we know eventually he's going to team with you as part of team Hogan. You guys are going to defeat team flair at lockdown 2010, uh, at bound for glory. Unbelievably Hardy's going to turn heel with Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff and with their help defeat angle and Anderson to win the TNA world heavyweight championship for the first time. They're then joined by Jeff Jarrett and Abyss, revealing the group that Abyss had been referring to as they 10, for several 10, months. 10, 10, 10. We're going to talk about that a lot more some other time, but were you, a, were you in favor of turning Jeff Hardy heel? Like you mentioned earlier, when you had a friend sort of scout a live event that they had a handful of WWE items and double that. And just Jeff Hardy items skews is what we call them different merch items, but the baby faces sell the merch, not the heel. So is this a financial risk to turn a guy who has historically been a needle mover for merch into a bad guy, or is the juice worth the squeeze because of the creative? I'm not going to say I, I, I could probably think of, well, yeah, I just thought of one, but when Hulk came in to his defense, it, it, he came in with all the power. If he kept things exactly the way they were, I know from his, I would, I would assume from his brain space, he would go, well, they don't need me here. They, they don't need this or that. Um, so I'm going to make a bunch of changes and, and Dixie encouraged it from the beginning. I always thought Hogan's best role would be an ambassador out validating what we were already doing. Uh, we were having success. We were profitable, but we needed a louder megaphone, a louder spokesman, a, a more well-known one, but you know, Hulk came in. What made the brand different? One of the things was six out of rink, get rid of that. You know, he dogged me on some promos who, for lack of a better word, as we've joked in this podcast, in a lot of ways, I was one of the faces from not a talent, from a business perspective uh, uh, of the brand. Well, Jeff Hardy is someone that we brought on board. Um, obviously, WWE massive lineage, but and we haven't really even got into it and God rest his soul, Don West, uh, he could talk for, for days and he would, you know, when we would strategize back at the office and going out on live events and the way Don would meticulously kind of get into the DNA of the strategy of how we were going to sell things, you know, he, he it, Hardy was always at the tip top, you know, uh, Kurt wouldn't sell a lot of t-shirts and merchandise, but everybody would, would love to have a picture with, with Kurt angle in the ring. Me, I'm going to sell 20, 25, 30 guitars at a high level. So sell some meet and greets. And, um, I'm, uh, you know, maybe selling the eight by tens in the program. And I'm kind of the face of the brand and all this Don had Jeff plugged in everywhere in that merch down to his wristbands and 
trinkets. He would say, all right, we got three or four trinkets of Jeff Hardy. We got three or four SKUs of T-shirts. Uh, we got to create this mega kind of grand thing of, hey, can we do a limited number of photo ops with Jeff during intermission? And that'll help us sell T-shirts, but we can only do 30. I mean, he Don was amazing on his strategy to monetize things. There was not even a close second that Jeff was our merch mover. Period. It's 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 even silly. I mean, he he, you know, it, it, I could go on and on about that. You know, I was recently telling a story about when I looked at the SKUs when the fiend was red hot. It was the fiend and others as far as selling merch of of the active roster. I'm sure Cena is ten to one right now selling merch, but Jeff was that needle mover, and when they came in, I understood that that Hogan and Eric wanted to do things different because in a lot of ways that may validate their, their high salaries and paychecks and all that. But creatively, I thought, okay, you're going to make Jeff Hardy. I don't even want to call him a heel. Let's call him an antagonist. What will he do to antagonize his protagonist? What, what do you, what's Jeff going to do to make people, either hate him or resent him or angry or whatever it is. That's just not in Jeff's character. And I'm not saying real life. I'm talking about his persona. So Conrad, I thought it was from a business perspective, a horrible decision. But at that point I was on the outside looking in and I, from a creative perspective, I ran the play to the best of my ability. I was worried about live events and international, but creatively, I went right along with it.